Our scripture reading today is Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thank you, brother. Well, um, I, I pray that as we go through today's teaching from the word, that, you know, we're, we have we've just read Romans 13, and this is an, a very important passage for our, tech, or for our time today, but it's not the only one. Uh, I, I encourage you, let's, let's see how God... Sh- and puts these things together for us to understand what his design is um, for government. We've already had the opportunity to have the political forum with Brad Dacus. That, that was a blessing. Who, who was able to either come or watch that, right? That was, I hope that was a blessing to you. It was to, to me and, and for those of us who were there and were able to speak with him afterward. That was an encouragement. But we really do think this is a timely message. Um, that way we can be engaged with what's going on. Um, what, we, what we really are asking for today's question is, what is God's intended design for human government? What is his intended design for human government? And, and let me just say up front, you're going to see that there are hardly none, you know, or who are rightly fitting this design perfectly. So I just want to say that up front. Uh, this is God's design, and... So we want to understand what that design is so that we can pray towards that direction. But um, there's going to be several points today. I think there's four or five points. And let's start with first things first. Let's just remind ourselves of what we should be starting point, which we always need to. It's this. Our first point is that God is king. God is king and has ordained human government for his glory. Okay, God is king and has ordained government for his glory. We, we had the call to worship this morning. Uh, just so you know, if you haven't heard that before, uh, the call to worship is literally when we together, the saints, come together and we are all called to now bring our attention to the, to the point now where let's sing our praise. Let's, let's worship God for who he is. Let's see how beautiful he is. Let's, let's magnify him. And, and this, this is why we chose the, the call to worship from this psalm today is because it's doing just that and it's pointing out God's kingship. Uh, psalm 47 verse th- 6 and through eight says, sing praises to God. It's a call. Sing praises. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a psalm. God reigns over the nations. He sits on his holy throne. The idea of government comes directly from God because God governs. He's a king. Uh, now, look at, he said, uh, king of all the earth. Look at what else it says he's king of. Psalm 95, verse 3. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He's not just the king of the earth and the, the sun, moon, and the stars and the trees. And he's not just king over creation. He's not just king over people. He's, he's king over the physical world, and he's king over the spiritual world, over the gods, over the angels, over the demons, 
He's literally the one who made it all, and we know this, but it's good to start at the beginning. We should always start at the beginning. So it's not just that God is king, but he then has ordained. He set it up. He structured government because he's a governor. He governs things to reflect him and his glory. Romans 13 is, is, is our passage, which we'll be touching on a lot, but Romans 13, verse 1, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Authority flows from God to different aspects of authority of, in the earth. There's no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. God, government is God's idea. It's God's idea. It's not a human construct. Just like the family is God's idea, God made man, God made woman, just like sex, men and women, that's God's idea, right? Family is God's idea, male and female, husband and wife, children, parents, that's God's idea. God made humanity, he made the family. He also makes government, he makes society to have people govern people and really, it's meant to be governed in a way that would point to the way God governs. God's government is meant to reflect God's goodness and God's glory. In fact, it says a little bit more clearly here um, why we're supposed to be subject in 1 Peter 2. It says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor, a supreme, that could be a king, or whether it to be, or to governors, I'll stop there. By the way, so emperor or governors, those are two different types of government, by the way. Uh, monarchy versus other types. What Peter is saying here is we're, we're in subjection to the government and the governing authorities because God, because God put them there and God is using them there for his glory. And it doesn't matter what type of government we have. We want to submit for the glory of God. We want to submit so that God gets the glory as we relate to the government. And uh, again, I'm not going to be able to say absolutely everything there is to say, but we want to kind of get the big picture and see the big important purposes of, of what God has set here. Let's look at our second point. The first is God is king, and he, he ordains government for his glory. Let's look at our second point for this morning. God designed government with a particular purposes. Here's the first particular purpose after glory. It's to punish evildoers. Punish evildoers. Um, Governments have a job to do. They have duties to carry out. And one of those duties is in related, it's related to responding to people's evil deeds. They're supposed to restrain evil by punishing it when it happens. Now, there's, a, there's an important order to that. The government does not um, punish you before you've done something. They only punish you after you've done something which is an important thing. They, they punish evildoers. They punish actions. They don't punish thoughts or intentions of the heart. This is an important, important understanding here. Let's, let's see this. Romans chapter uh, 13, verse 2 and 3. It says, uh, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. Remember, it's God's idea. It's God's plan to... For rulers are not a terror to good conduct. Rulers, rulers are happy with you when you're doing good. You're not going to be uh, bumping into the rulers when you're doing a good job. When you're going to be bumping into the rulers, when you're, supposed to, when you're going to be bumping into government, is when you do bad. Is when, when you do some evil conduct. In fact, First Peter, it says a very similar thing. Um, be subject, First Peter 2, be subject to the, for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether, to be the, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to what? To punish those who do evil. People must do evil, and then the government's job is to say, no, nope, can't do that. The evil that you're doing is having an effect on your neighbors, on society around you. We must protect society from evil, do, from evil being done. Can we, can we see how God is lovingly instituting a system that when it works, it actually promotes health? It promotes goodness. In fact, um, that's 
<laughs> that's the uh, that's going to be one of our next points. But but we really do have to um, understand here that the government, as as we see this design, it's meant when it comes to evil doing, it's meant to respond to evil, and it's meant to punish it when it does wrong. So let me take this moment here and say, um, isn't it true that just look at another part of life? Isn't it true that when parents don't uh, punish their children for, for evil doing, that evil continues <laughs> and often can get, can compound out of hand. When there is no consequences for people's destructive behavior, that it actually creates um, pretty toxic, pretty disorderly, pretty destructive arenas, right? Wouldn't we say that punishment of evil is a good thing? That, that's a good thing. Like People are not allowed to, to, to to hurt people, to murder people. They're not allowed to, to steal things. They're not allowed to, they're not allowed. They're not allowed to punch somebody in the face. For, you just can't do that, right? We, we need to dignify, we need to understand that people have dignity. They're made in the image of God and they deserve to be protected. So let's look then at a, another general purpose here. First is to glorify God, show his beauty. Second is to specifically punish evil when it's done. And third, there's a distinction here. Let's look at our third point. God designed government to praise, to praise good conduct. They punish evil, which is an action that takes place materially, like meaning it's a physical action. When somebody physically does something evil, then they're going to have some sort of actual response by the government. But let's talk about this concept of the government and then praising good. That's different than punishing. Romans 3 or Romans 13, verse 3. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct. Rulers love it when you do good. They love it when the people in which they are governing over does good. But they're a terror to bad, meaning they're, they punish the bad behavior. Would you have no fear of the one who's in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Meaning, do if you are acting like a kind citizen who is seeking the welfare of the people around you, you're not trying to hurt people, you're trying to work live peaceably with people, you're, you're seeking to, you know, to, to sort of mind your own business in the sense of you're not hurting other people in their business, um, the government loves you because they don't have to worry about you. You're doing a great job. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, be subject um, for the Lord's sake, every human institution, uh, and to, uh, whether it's emperor, supreme, or the governors who are sent by him, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. So if we do good, we should be hearing or we should be, uh, it wouldn't be that weird for us to be get plaques on the wall or to get certificates or to, to be uh, praised by saying, we really appreciate how these particular citizens are behaving with each other because they are promoting good things amongst them. They're promoting peaceableness. They're promoting fair actions in their, in their businesses. They're promoting helpful practices in their education, in their health care, uh, in, in their neighborhoods. Look at the way that these, these citizens are behaving. They're doing an excellent job. The government is actually called to encourage good, but notice that the government is not actually called to do good. People are called to do good, and the government is trying to protect the, the society so that the society does good, and the government comes in when society does not do good, and they, they become the arbiter to say, that's unfair, you can't do that, that's stealing, you can't do that, and they punish evil, but they praise good. Can we see the distinction here between the government having a responsibility to act when it comes to evil but they have more of a responsibility to encourage us to do good. Can we see that? There's a difference between praise and punishment. One is active and one is suggestive. You see that? Uh, in fact, but we have to ask the question, what is good? We have to ask the question, what is good? Is it good in the eyes of an individual person? Is it good in the eyes of the government officials? Or is there something else? I think we, sh we can know by now that only God is good. Amen? Can I get an amen? Only God is good. And, and it's his good law, his good scriptures that really paint the, the right and best picture of what good looks like in human flourishment. 
And so let me just read some very clear things. Romans 7, verse 12. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. Government is actually, if they're to do the job the way that God has intended them to do, their government, they should have a concept of good and evil that matches God's concept of good and evil. And so God wants them, just like he said, um, do you do, you know, do you not want to, do you not have fear over those who are in authority? Then do good. Otherwise, God, he is the avenger of God's, he's a terror to evil conduct. Any evil conduct? No, evil conduct that God says is evil. And so God has the definitions of righteousness and justice and goodness and fairness and peace and tranquility. 1 Timothy 1, verse 8 and 9 now we know that the law is good. God's law is good if one uses it lawfully. What does that mean? That insinuates that somebody cannot understand or use God's law lawfully. People have the ability to misuse God's law or to misunderstand or to not enforce God's law. God's law is what is considered good, not whatever the government comes up with. God, God, God is the, good, or the standard of good. Look what it says. Now, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just. This is interesting. Who is the law for? Here's the answer. The law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless, the disobedient, for the ungodly, for, and sinners, for the unholy and, pro, and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, and for murderers. I can go on and on. But what I wanted to show here that is that the law is good if it is used to be understood as the, this is the standard by which people should be living righteously with each other. And notice that it gave you evil deeds of what people are going to be punished for. Striking of one's mother, murderers. This is the way the law should be used. God's law should be used that way. Now, let me, let me take us to another scripture here. Because there may be some questions coming up, you know, in our mind about different things. But I, I want to show us something that I really think is, is helpful from the words of Jesus. All right, from the words of Jesus. And it's this concept that Jesus had, a con had the understanding that human government was meant by its very virtue to be a limited government. God, Jesus is, this is Jesus' words. He's saying, no, the government has a limit to its jurisdiction. Um, remember the story when they're trying to trick Jesus and they, they say, hey, Jesus, should we pay our taxes? Meaning we're supposed to get, rah, rah, we're supposed to get all riled up because the government is, you know, doing a bad job or they're, they're overtaxing or they're being oppressive and they thought they were going to catch Jesus in, you know, in a trap. And, and so they say, hey, should we do this? And, and so Jesus says, get a coin, get a coin. Whose likeness, Matthew chapter 22, whose likeness and inscription is on this? And they said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, meaning Caesar has things that we're supposed to give him. And then he says, very important conclusion to the statement, and to God the things that are God's. Now, if we pay attention and we... we we understand what's going on here. Jesus is saying, go ahead, pay the tax. But keep in mind that you owe Caesar certain things. You owe Caesar taxes, and we're going to get into other things of what we owe Caesar. But Caesar has a limit to what we owe him. We owe him taxes. We actually do. The Bible says it really clear. I mean this. For any Christian, you know, Bible-believing Christian, I, I, I don't think we have any problem in here, of course, but I... Um, there's just absolutely no excuse for us n not paying taxes. Like, there are, ta you know, we could talk about whether or not these taxes are good or whether or not these taxes are helpful, and we could try to encourage the process by which we have a, a tax situation. But taxes is a part of life, right? You've probably heard it, death and taxes, right? Um, yeah, Jesus would even believe that in the sense of taxes are a part of this world's life. But don't miss the last part. You owe Caesar his part, but you owe God what? Everything. Doesn't God own everything? Isn't everything for God and from God and through God and to God? Isn't God's jurisdiction all of it? He's the king of all. 
So by contrast, you have God and you have Caesar. And so what Jesus is saying here is go ahead and give Caesar his due. But just remember, his due is a smaller part of the big, which means this is a concept of limited government. God's got a comprehensive government, and then you could, by, by virtue, say family has a government, Fathers, mothers, they're supposed to govern their children. It's a jurisdiction. Um, the church has its government. They're supposed to rule through the word, its people, organize them for the worship of God. The government has its jurisdiction. Everybody's got lanes, and all of our lanes are underneath God. And so, by the very nature of this, the question, you know, we see that Jesus is narrowing the scope of what government's role is, um, then we need to ask, okay, well then, just how big is that jurisdiction? Like, how, how are they supposed to go about doing this law stuff? And I, and I, I, I want to appeal to you, it's what we've already said. They're, they're supposed to punish, they're supposed to respond, they're supposed to establish good laws according to the principles found in Scripture, the explicit teaching and the principles found in Scripture. And, and can I say this? How else will our government and governors and rulers know what they're, what they're supposed to do unless we tell them? We, we are supposed to encourage, educate, help our government in what, any way we can. We're supposed to do it in a respectful way, but we're supposed to help our government know what God is calling them to do. Do they know by themselves? It's a big responsibility. I mean it. I am not responsible for millions of people. What a huge, massive responsibility for a president, for a governor, for um, you know, assemblymen, for, for senators, for, for that's, this is in our government setup. You know, there's other governments out there with, with monarchies. You know, what, an, what, a, what a massive responsibility that uh, maybe a king and his family would have to do to be the ones entrusted to ru rule the land on God's behalf. That is a, such a massive thing. We should do everything we can to help them by giving them the truth of the word because we're for them. We, when they rule the way God wants them to rule, everybody wins. Everybody wins. So we can love our neighbor by helping our rulers, by encouraging them towards godliness, towards righteousness, towards peace, towards justice. But let's look at the limited nature of this thing because you go, well, well God's law, there's a lot of things in the scriptures. Like, is every single, you know, verse and is, is, is all the Old Testament relevant? Like, how exactly does this work because I understand that you know the, the Bible's good and the law is good but but how much of it are are today are we supposed to be applying? And I and I want to say notice what it says punishing evil deeds and praising good deeds according to God's scripture. Let's look at the Ten Commandments. Okay, let's look at the Ten Commandments. All right? These are just base level moral law of God. This is written on the on the hearts of men and every everybody's accountable to the Ten Commandments. I'm going to make uh, an assertion to you that I think is founded in this idea of a limited government, that the government does not have the jurisdiction of people's religious worship. Because let's think about this. Jesus just said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, and give to God's what is God's. What would God's domain include? It would include worship. Now, let's see how then this affects maybe the ruling of the Ten Commandments. I would, I would, appeal, I would show you that I think... The, the government is not, uh, is not, it's not their role to enforce the first four of the Ten Commandments. I mean this. Let's, let's read these. You shall have no other gods before me, Exodus 20. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord of your God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now these are all true, unchanging, true. And this has to do with how we worship. There's only one true God, and it is wrong. It is evil to worship another God. But is the government, is it their job to, to enforce people's religious activity? I mean it. Is it the government's job to say, which tarot card reader, you can't worship that God? Christian, you can't worship that God. Muslim, you can't worship that God. It's not the government's job to, 
to enforce these good laws because that's not their jurisdiction. You see that? God will enforce his own laws, by the way. We as the church are calling people to obey God. So this is why we preach the gospel. We say preach the, preach the good news. Jesus has come. He is Savior. He is King. And he's calling everyone everywhere to repent. He will forgive us. We are wicked sinners. But he will forgive us because he took the penalty on the cross. He, he obeyed perfectly what we deserved. Follow him. Which, you don't have to be a witch. Mormon, you don't have to be a Mormon. I mean, pick, pick your flavor. You don't have to be. Jesus is the only true one. Follow him. God, God is not calling the government to enforce worship. But let's look even more at the second. It's called, there's the first table of the law, the second table of the law. This is the, you know, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, okay, so here's the second part of the Ten Commandments. We could see how there might be more things that line up. Let me read this. Honor your mother and your father. You shall not murder you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness about, against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house, and so on and so on. Maid servant and all these things. Let me encourage you. I would appeal to you, based on Romans and First Peter, that the government's role is not to enforce honoring your mother and your father. They do not enforce our love and appreciation for our parents. They don't enforce that. What they do is they encourage that. You see that? They encourage us doing good, but they don't punish us if we don't. Do you see this? There's an, there's an important distinction between compelling or forcing people to do something instead of, instead of just punishing when they, don't, when they do something evil. There's a difference. They don't push us in a direction. They they punish us when we cross the line. So they can punish when we murder. They can punish when, when there's a, uh, people are, are uh, affecting other people, like adultery. Um, there's a sense in which uh, somebody has violated somebody else's uh, covenant bond, and we could allow people in court to deal with this out. In, the, the, the government can encourage these sorts. No, you cannot take somebody else's wife. No, you can't do that. Um, honor the law of marriage, um, which, by the way, the government cannot define what marriage is and isn't. That, that's not their jurisdiction. That, that's God's jurisdiction. They, but they can punish when somebody steals. They can, they can um, under perjury, like perjury laws, when you lie, they, they can punish. They can, put, they can put a crime to that. Like, um, so I want to encourage you. The government's role is meant to be limited, and it's a beautiful thing when they do a good job, um, but let me, let me get to our, our last kind of major point here of, of what they're called to do. The first, it's all, God is king, it's all for his glory, and he set it up so that they would punish evil and they would praise the good, which means they're encouraging that we do good. Let's see how this last part, uh, God's design for government is to promote peace, promote peace. And this is, this is the idea that um, they really are setting up us to do the good. And one is praising, like, hey, good job. Another one is protecting. It's kind of defense. It's a defense of peace. Look what it says. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And then it tells you who those all people are. For kings and for all who are in high positions. And look what it says. That we, we pray for the governors and the, gov and the leaders. Why? So that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life that we may lead a godly and dignified life in every way. So the government is not actually the one living the godly life or the peaceful life or the quiet life. The government is promoting that we live that. And so they're trying to get out of our way so that we can do good things. Now, let me, let me first say that there are good godly reasons why government should be involved in things like research. 
and, and um, promotion, like educational research, health research, business research. I am so grateful that there is an SEC. You know what I mean? SEC, Security Exchange Commission. Those are the guys that when on, on Wall Street, when something bad goes down because of illegal trading and stock manipulation, these are the guys who call foul. These are the ones who are going, you literally just manipulated markets to be able to, to profit millions of dollars at the loss of other people's money. We, this is when people steal. This is when people cheat. This is when people do something that hurts their neighbors and they're not playing. We need these types of regulative pressures that restrain evil. This is God's good design to restrain evil by punishing it when it happens and by setting up good laws that encourage people to do good things. Um, but look, look at this point. In, in Timothy, this is very important. We're supposed to pray for our leaders so that we live a peaceable, quiet life. And look at what the very next verses say. When we live, and we are, are living in a peaceful society, look at what the results may be when we are living in peace. Verse 3 of 1 Timothy 2 says, this is good. What? That we live peaceably and dignified and godly in every way? This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of our God, the God of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved we already, uh, and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. When government does their job and when society does their job, what does that set up? That sets up a situation where people can get saved. That's literally what, that's one of the major reasons why we should seek the peace of our land and we should seek to encourage our government to be a peaceable government because when people are not under threat, but people have the, they have, they have an easier access by which they can have clear gospel witness. I mean this. And this doesn't mean that, you know, God hasn't or, or doesn't use persecution and trying times. This doesn't have to mean that only people will come to faith when it's easy. But there's something about not having restrictions in society that actually allows for the freedom of thoughts and ideas and interactions that are unhindered. And so we want a free society so that we can freely share the gospel. Amen? Amen. Amen. We want this. This is a beautiful thing. In fact, uh, let's connect it to 2 Peter. 2 Peter 3, it says, uh, look at God's patience. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some have count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should, should reach repentance. But, but look, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the earth and the works and all that are in them will be exposed. You know, our current land, our current governments, our current social structures will all be over in the future. They will all be redone because Jesus, the one true king, will come to claim his, all of his heavens and his earth, and everything will be rightly brought underneath the feet of Jesus, the one true king. In the meantime, government has a role to play to, to restrain evil and to promote good. And really what that pushes us to do, the government's job is to promote self-government. Did you hear that? The, the government's job is to promote yours and mine own government, meaning, meaning we govern ourselves well. That's their job. They, 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 their encouragement, hey, make sure that people aren't killing people, people aren't stealing things, people aren't cheating, people are, promo are, are living peaceably. I just want to say thank you to, to Bob and to any of our law enforcement. Thank you to Joel, who's been on, on front lines working for our government because they are literally promoting good. They're protecting people's lives every, every time they're out there doing their job. It's, it's, it, think about it like this. God made, God is a God of systems, God makes systems where people and, and organisms work together. And when it works together, 
beautifully, things work right, and, th- and it promotes good. Think about our bodies. God made our bodies, right? He made our bodies to work in systems. You know, we have blood that circulates. We have lungs that pump. And, and when things are working correctly, we have life, right? But when things are breaking down and things are, are, are sick and not working the way they should, there's pain. There's destruction. There's hurt. Well, that's the same way for human government. Like, literally, it's almost like, like, I'm, like in, our, in our highway patrol, I'm going to talk to our brother here. Our, when we have the California Highway Patrol who is governing the, the highways and they are saying, yes, you should travel at certain speeds because those are the speeds by which people can stay alive. <laughs> those that people are supposed to stay in their lanes and not cross into other lanes because that kind of behavior is going to promote dangerous things where people get hurt. Literally, getting into a car and driving at high speeds is one of the danger, most dangerous things that any of us will probably do, and we do it all the time. And so it is godly for there to be enforcement and for there to be laws that promote peace and life and good. And, we, and I mean this. If, if we get tickets or if we do any of that, we should, I mean, it's hard, but in our God, Jesus help us. In, in, in the Holy Spirit, may the Holy Spirit convict us and say, I needed this reminder. I needed this reminder that I'm not my own person and I'm a part of this society and I should be doing things that, that aren't endangering other people's lives. This is a good thing. And I know that nobody likes getting citations. I know that nobody likes having to pay their money that way. But if we understand that God sort of does one of these, it's okay. Like, meaning, we'll we'll get over it. We'll learn from that. Now, granted, am, am I saying that all government is always doing good all the time and that all the laws are perfect? No, that's, I mean, I think you and I have felt that, that, that not everything is absolutely perfect. But we live in a situation where we actually have quite a bit of influence in the ability to uh, encourage laws. I mean, the fact that we're going to be voting, maybe some of you have already voted. I, I hope this is an encouragement to you, even if you've already voted. But if you haven't yet, I mean, it matters whether or not how the government uses tax money to be able to, like, what is, is the, these propositions, are they being used in the way, you know, the way that would be best, you know, promoting peace and, and promoting, uh, you know, promoting health and life in a way that God sees it, in, in the lane that the government is, is supposed to stay in? We should be asking these questions. This is what Christians bring to the table. They bring the scriptures. They bring thoughtfulness. And it's not, we're not the only ones that are thoughtful, but we should come at it distinctly from a Christian angle. So let me, let me ask this question. What do we owe the government? Romans 13, 7. It says, pay all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. We owe these things. We owe them taxes. We owe them revenue. We owe them our subjection. Like we, we, will, we will intentionally submit ourselves to them because they are good for, for, for our good. We owe them respect. We owe them honor. Um, and I think that that is a, if I could say this, we would owe this to anybody. Could we, could we see how this is not necessarily only government? We would owe anybody who we owe a, a transaction to that. We, 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 we're not owing... God's not asking us to do something um, outlandish. Um, so so let, me, let me start off and, and, and just mark here. I, 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 God is good. He's a good governor. He governs the world. And he makes good things. And so we should see the good for what it is. Now let me also acknowledge people are sinful. Amen. <laughs> And people who are in government are sinful. Amen? And people, and there is such thing as corruption. Amen? I mean, we see that all over the Old and New Testament, but we see it in Old Testament very clearly saying, what kind of judges should you have? People who don't take bribes. People who, who love truth and justice. People who have equal measures. And so I do think that in our situation, we should be seeking justice and peace uh, as much as we have the ability to with the understanding that Jesus is the only one who can fix this world. Jesus is the only one who's going to rightly 
organize all governments in all worlds. We cannot fix this world, period. We cannot. So we should not get our expectations so high in, as that it's all about this endeavor. But we should not ditch this endeavor because what we're saying is we, are, we don't essentially want to be a part of society. There's no such thing as a society without its rulers. Rulers and society are a part of an organism that work together. So let me, um, let me just, we're going to be ending here soon. Let's, what does this look like, right? How do we best relate to the government? I'm, I'm going to give us three, three different uh, P words that I think can help us just from the scriptures. And the first is, I think we should praise God. We should praise God for his good design and uh, for his glory and for our good. We should praise God that he made government. We should praise God that he, he instituted, and, and it's his idea that there should be people who look out for everyone. There are people, like, it's a good thing that there are police officers who that are, it's their job to, when they get a call of some crime or something, they are freed up to go deal with people for the sake of life. We should say, good thinking, Jesus. Like, people are, people are, messed up and they're selfish. Praise God that you instituted a system by which people can cannot just have their life be taken all the time. Do you know what this reminds me of? This reminds me of the Noahic covenant. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 9. What, is, what does God do in the Noahic covenant? He says, you know what? I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> I'm going to set up the world so that you continue to live. I'm going to protect and preserve your life by not judging you for what you righteously deserve. And if you think about it, I mean, it is a grace, a common grace that God would give us a, a human form of protection that keeps our lives going. That it's not just the wild, wild west. Everybody's out for themselves. That's why you've got to be ready to, you know, kill and be killed. No, that's not, that's, that's not God's design. God's design is for life. And so he's protecting it. So we should praise God for this. Um, a, a second P, we should not just praise, but um, is we should pray. We should pray for the government leaders. We're, we're commanded to do that. And what should we pray for them? We should pray that they get saved, and we should pray that they do their job. Right? What does it say? For government leaders to punish evil, to praise good, and to promote peace. That's what we should be praying for. And we should be praying that Christians go into government and that Christians surround governors. And that we should be praying for that because this is, is, is a part of God's good plan. That supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and for those in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life. And let's look at this. Um, let's praise God for his good design. Let's pray for, for the government and for our leaders to do their job as God says to do their job in their lane, stay in your lane, do a good job, do what you, and then let's us, let's us stay in our lane, do what we're supposed to do. And then let's look at the third P, it's to participate. Let's participate in good works that God has prepared for us. Titus 3, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. The government's job is to promote us so that we can participate in society so that we can promote peace and justice, so that we can have good practices in our family, in our businesses, in our health, in our education, in our retirements. We should be cooperating with each other and with people who have similar goals to do good things with one another in society, and the government's supposed to protect that. And, and so we should participate for the good works. Look what it says. Don't speak evil of, of no one. Avoid quarreling and be gentle. Show perfect courtesy to all people. And I love this, it, uh, Ephesians 2, connects our salvation to our good works. It says, for, great you've, for grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And let me encourage you, for those who feel like, oh my goodness, there's so much to be done. Like, what do I do first? Do I, you know, do I go on my my education board or, or, you know, my city, do I, do I have to, what does that mean for me practically? You know, do I have to go to city council meetings? Do I, like, there's so many things to be about that could be overwhelming. Like, what are you saying then? If, 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 how do I participate? And I want to encourage you, look what it says. God prepared good works for us ahead of time. 
So let me say that God already has a plan for us. God has a plan for our lives that includes the good works that he has for us. Our, we, the goal is not to do anything that is good. The goal is to do the good that God has assigned to us to do, which means we need to look at our lives through a prioritized uh, list of responsibilities. We should start with ourselves. We should have a good self-government. We should have self-control. We should promote our, I mean this, we should pro- promote life within ourself. We should eat well, sleep well, you know, take care of our bodies, take care of our minds. Why? For God's glory, not for our glory. We should love God with our body. It's his body, right? So it starts with self-government, and then it works out from there. We, we're responsible to our families, right? That's the family unit that God gave us. So let's seek the good in our families. Husbands, wives, parents, siblings, aunts, uncles, all those people that God has sovereignly placed in our life. Remember Acts 17. God is the one who determines where people live and what, pa- what period of time they live, the boundaries by which they live. God is prepared for that ahead of time. So let's pay attention to our prioritized list of responsibilities. So our self, our family, our church. God has given us our church to seek the peace in, to seek the, to seek the welfare in, to, to take care of one another's needs. He's given us our neighbors. That may be our physical neighbors, like the ones we actually live next to. It may be our work neighbors, the one we see on a regular basis. Our city neighbors. I think we should work from simple and have the, our life go further and further out. And let's take care of our own and move that out. And you know what we should be doing, I think, is we should be seeking to live a godly life so that, and not wasting our time so that we have more capacity to love other people. I mean this. When we organize our life in a disciplined way, when we're getting filled up with the, with the Spirit of God, through the Word of God, through the praises of God, we actually have more energy and we have more love. Did you know that when you're praying with God and it's seeking His face and you're, and, you're, and you're singing songs like, Jesus, you're better. Jesus, you're better. When you're getting filled up and your soul is getting filled up, you know that literally makes you more healthy? It literally makes you, gives you more energy and more capacity because He's filling you up. And so we can love more people, but not love, we don't have to love absolutely everyone. We're supposed to love the people that God has given us to love ahead of time. You see that? We're not responsible for the world. This is God's world. This is my father's world. So we should be content to be okay. We're not going to fix the world. He's got a plan for that. We'll trust him. And so we should discern that. So let me end by saying this. Part of the reason we wanted to talk about this is because Many of us, and many of those around us, seem to have a strained relationship with government. Can we say that? A strained relationship with government. And let me, let me see this. There's a spectrum of which people live on uh, in terms of their relationship with government. And I'll start on one side. There are people who are so upset, so disgruntled, so disgusted, those are all, I guess, uh, with, with, with government, they don't want to have anything to do with it. They're just, it's corrupt, it's, it's not, you know, it's not good, it's, it, it's, it's unrighteous, it's set against me, it's not going to be good. So there are people who really, they don't want to have anything to do with government. They would rather just say, hey, get out of my hair, I don't appreciate you, I'm not for you. There are people on one side who really disdain government. And that's, that's not okay. It's not okay to hate the government. Now, it is okay to call out the sin that the government does and to call them to righteousness and to call them to the the standards that God has. It's it's okay and it's right to call the government to their job, but to do it respectfully, peaceably, with honor and dignity and respect. That's one side. So some people need to hear, I don't have anybody in mind, but there's a spectrum. There are people who just hate the government and they're, they're, they're rebellious. Can I say this? They're rebellious. They don't want people telling them what to do. And those people need to repent. And I've, you know, I I swing all over the spectrum. Sometimes I'm there and I need to repent. And the Lord needs to tell me, submit, my son, submit. I I put this for your good. And then let's swing to the other side. There are some people who are so invested in government and the governing authorities and the government system, it's literally all they think about, all they watch. And they are so invested in the government that literally the government has become essentially their God. They are putting all their ducks in that category to say, if the government doesn't do something for me, if the government doesn't, then the whole world is coming to an end. 
This side says, get me away from government. This guy says, the government is everything. And, and frankly, it's idolatrous. Literally, if, if the government is the one that needs to do everything for you, if the government needs to give you food, if the government needs to give you work, if the government needs to pay your retirement, give you your health care, if the government is your business, and you are so reliant on the government to where you just say, give me, give me, give me, that's idolatrous. That's, it's not okay. We need to trust God for those things, right? We need, to, we need to live our lives according to God's plan for the family, for the, the church, for the government, for society. And it's not that, well, yeah, so there are some people who take it way too far, and it, it, whatever the government does, they're, they're, just, they're just busted up if it doesn't go their way. And I really think there's a middle ground. And it's a, we praise God for his good design, and we are aware of the sin in the system. And what we do is we pray to a higher government and we say, God, you got all power and authority. Please fix our land. Please lead us in righteousness. Forgive us of our sin and lead us in the way everlasting. And so we're not ditching government and we're not deifying government. We're really participating it with faith in Jesus Christ. He is better, isn't he? He's a better governor, he's a better king. And so we trust him, and we do what we're called to do, live good lives. So I pray you're encouraged. I pray you're encouraged. We don't have to get tired of all this. It is tiring, but we can trust the one, the one true king. So again, let me invite you. If, if you're interested in talking more about this, we had our forum. We're, we're taking this one week to talk about this. If this raises questions in your mind about education, about business, about healthcare, about homelessness, if it raises questions in your mind about what we can actually practically do, I think it would be a a very profitable thing for us to see who's interested in continuing the conversation and move the ball forward in in seeing how God, through his word, can encourage us. If that's something you're interested in, let us know. Maybe we'll do another forum. Maybe we'll we'll have, uh, you know, Sunday schools or something related to to God of these things. That there's difficult things and disagreements. But Lord, would you please bless them with righteousness, bless them with people to help them govern well, and Lord, help us to speak up when we can or to vote or to to do things that would promote the goodness for our land because they're your goodness. So Lord, we thank you and we trust you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. God, God bless you guys.